My mother was a very generous person. She was, however, a horrific cook. I mean, her prepared meals were so bad that the deepest scars of my childhood are not connected to my father's severe alcoholism, but to Tuesday night's roast beef. My mother was from the old Germanic school where everything on the plate had to be eaten, even if the offerings looked like leftovers from a fire bombing. Of course, I tried my best to somehow get the food down, ranging from putting it in my dog Kubla's mouth, after one whiff she ran to the backyard, to hiding it under a napkin, or worse yet, placing it folded up in my Catholic elementary school uniform pants. Unfortunately, my hurried methods only exasperated the situation since my mother, taking a cue from the movie Stalag 17, invariably discovered my escape hatches and promptly sat me down again until I ate every last morsel. I say all of this is a prelude to some of the happiest memories of my childhood. This is when on Friday nights my mother chose not to cook and we would end up scarfing down some takeout from Bob's Big Boy or a cheese pizza from the nearby pizza man he delivers. To top it off, my two brothers and my only sister were each allowed to have one 12 ounce bottle of Coke, along with some buttered popcorn. This was in the early 1960s, where we would all sit around the television and watch first run episodes of the Flintstones, the Twilight Zone, the Jetsons, and my all time favorite, Johnny Quest. It was a supremely blissful time for me, and I think it was right there and then that I began my lifelong love affair with Coca-Cola. As almost any psychologist will tell you, food has an emotional component for most homo sapiens, both positive and negative, and I think it is little wonder that these Friday night respites represented something magical to me. Indeed, my fondness for Coca-Cola was such that my older brother and I would often get into philosophical conversations about it ruminating whether, and here Plato's ideal forms played a part, there existed such a thing as a perfect coke. We had noticed over the years that not all Cokes tasted the same. For instance, the steel can versions of Coke, aluminum had yet to been introduced, tended to have a rusty taste to them, especially if they were buried in ice for too long. Even the bottle version suffered from a metallic funkiness if the cap got too much moisture. The tap Coke was also very inconsistent. Sometimes the carbonation would be less than optimal, and at other times the sweetness was absent. Most of the time, if we were thirsty enough, we just ignored the subtle and not so subtle gradations in Coca-Cola. But the more we became addicted to the stuff, the more important it became to get the drink just right. I think most Coca-Cola drinkers would agree that there is an aggregate of key markers that result in a truly magnificent Coke. First and foremost on my list would be the burn. This has a twofold aspect. Sufficiently high carbonation coupled with a very slight bitter edge. It is this latter aspect which distinguishes Coca-Cola from Pepsi, a challenger lacking that two-pronged attack. Second, a great Coke has to have the right amount of sweetness and effervescence. And third, something which goes without saying is that the Coke has to be properly chilled. All three of these factors, however, have to be enveloped into a larger context which can be crucial for a Coke to have that transcendent quality. It all comes down to when and where and with what. The right time, the right place, but most importantly, the right food. I have found that over the years that a Coke tastes best with foods that are dry, salty, spicy, or best yet, all three. My personal favorite is a falafel pita sandwich. In point of fact, I simply cannot eat a falafel without a burning Coke going along with it. 
For most of my childhood, I had a fair share of good and bad Cokes. But something genuinely remarkable happened during my 15th year that had forever changed my understanding of what a Coke could be and what it could ultimately signify. August 20th, 1971. The liquid hierophany occurred on what was otherwise a nondescript day. My brother and I had surfed at Trancas Beach, which was just north of Malibu. And on our drive back to the valley, we were overwhelmed by the onslaught of a deepening heat wave. We were, unfortunately, completely out of disposable cash, so we couldn't quench our parched throats. As we entered into our backyard, our mother shouted that she wanted us to run some errands for her probably the last thing one wants to hear after a good day of surfing. She gave us a laundry list of things to pick up at Fedco in Van Nuys. Fedco was in many ways a forerunner of the large warehouse stores so popular today, such as Costco and Sam's Club. We belly ached and somehow managed to manipulate a few extra quarters from our mom so we could buy a Coke while we were hunting for her numerous kitchen items. Joe and I were by this moment beyond thirsty, so we were anxious to get some bubbly nectar. However, Fedco is not exactly known for having the best Cokes, so we were not expecting much. As I was walking near the deli just inside Fedco, I saw a young blonde haired girl behind the counter serving drinks and sandwiches to a line of customers. Yet what really caught my eye was not her obvious beauty, but the bubbly flow coming out of the tap. For some strange reason, I sensed that this fountain Coke held some promise. I immediately told my brother that we needed to make a beeline to the counter. He too saw the beautiful young girl, but soon focused on the real object of our affection, the liquid elixir. She handed the first Coke to my brother and then repeated the ritual and placed in my hands the second cup of Coca-Cola. My brother and I nodded at each other and then proceeded to take our first sip. Immediately, without any warning whatsoever, I felt transported into another realm. The taste was so exquisite that I couldn't speak, as if each carbonated bubble was a world of bliss all of its own. I was in a state of liquid ecstasy. I turned to look at my brother and saw that tears were running down his cheeks. Not from the burn, mind you, but from the absolute wonder of the drink. My brother and I had, without any doubt whatsoever, finally found the perfect Coke. We hugged in a state of euphoria. At the tender age of 15, the perfect Coke became more than just a fantastic occasion. It became a signpost to wake up to the almost infinite possibilities that life can proffer. The provisio here, of course, is that one must remain vigilantly and acutely aware that underlying every nano event, there is a matrix of intersecting probabilities, such that at any turn, at any moment, the unexpected can happen. A perfect wave, a perfect sunset, or in my case, a perfect cup.